Okay, we're back live. Day two at Strata Conference. I'm John Furrier, the founder of SiliconAngle.com, and we're bringing you all the in-depth coverage here at uh, this Dave Vellante calling my co-host, who's not here right now. I'll decline that. Uh, welcome back for day two. Yesterday we broadcast from 3 o'clock all the way to 7, had some great interviews, very informal, and uh, had some great conversations, and I, we, you can find all the coverage on SiliconAngle.com, SiliconAngle.tv. Day two at Strata, it's buzzing right now. The theme this year is obviously big data, big data, changing society, and we're going to have all that in-depth analysis. However, the big deal right now is live streaming. SiliconAngle.tv and with Wikibon are going to be going all hours, eight hours a day here at Estrada. Also, O'Reilly Media has multiple live streams this year. They're basically going to be putting out everything on video. So you can find the O'Reilly keynotes. You can find O'Reilly's how-tos. they got kind of a cube version of their own that they're doing, kind of a news desk that's very O'Reilly-like, very sit-down, how-to videos. That's all great. That's all great for the O'Reilly coverage. However, here at theCUBE, we're going to bring you the independent analysis. Basically, the morning keynotes sound like what we talked about yesterday at theCUBE. Data science is hot, data is the real deal, and you can find coverage on siliconangle.com and under the CIO sections of Forbes.com where we posted uh, this morning. So, again, I'm John Furrier with siliconangle.com. We are theCUBE. This is our flagship telecast. We go out to the events and bring the coverage straight to you. Um, so the news of the day today is essentially big data here at Hadoop, outside and around the web, Windows 8 consumers available for download and playing around. The iPad 3 is going to be debuted on March 7th. Um, obviously all this is pointing to a massive change in the business, user experiences, and big data is powering it all. Big data is the new, the new enabler for innovation. So as the stock market rebounds, as Facebook goes public, as this new innovation hits the scene, Big Data and Hadoop is powering it all. The other big story here from Strata is that Hadoop is being coined as a new industry standard. There has been enough rallying of support around Hadoop that essentially all the industry leaders are saying Hadoop is now an industry standard and the platform is maturing and matured. And Mike Olson from the CEO of Cloudera said that today on his keynote. So Hadoop is a standard. Emerging ecosystem developing very rapidly around Hadoop from not only startups like Cloudera, Hortonworks, MapR, 1010 Data, and Digital Reasoning, but the big guys, EMC, IBM, HP, all have great solutions. And even Microsoft has, has a solution with Hortonworks. So you know, you're seeing a massive, massive demand for big data solutions. And as I posted today, there's a big side effect of all this, and that is there's a services boom. Consulting and services is really the hot sector right now. Both product companies and consulting services is the big trend. So we're here on the ground. SiliconANGLE will bring you all the coverage. So stay tuned here and watch that. And now we're going to take a look at uh, an interview with uh, uh, consulting services boss at EMC, Tom Roloff, who heads up their global services organization. And he also is the boss of Bill Schmarzo, who was on the Cube yesterday. Uh, Bill Schmarzo is being called the dean of big data at EMC. Great guy, Cube alumni. So take a look at this video from EMC. The services revolution is changing because of the demand in big data is creating a massive boom in both products and services. And essentially the big problem is people want to get big data solutions right now and there's just not enough talent to do that. So uh, listen to Tom Roloff and, and hear the story from EMC. By all accounts, the 2010s will mark the decade that cloud computing came into its own and went mainstream. But lots of questions remain, particularly around this largely untested utility computing model. As the organizational IT management and risk management disciplines and profiles transition from the physical to the virtual world, it's jump ball on security and privacy. What's more, as SaaS-based applications go from small work groups to enterprise scale and mission critical apps get virtualized, the rules of the game change dramatically. Security and privacy protections are top of mind today among CIOs and buyers of cloud services. How will the security model change? What new challenges does cloud computing and virtualization bring? Where are the pitfalls and how can they be avoided? Hello everybody, this is Dave Vellante. Welcome to theCUBE, where we extract the signal from the noise and bring you the enterprise technology leaders that are shaping cloud, mobile, and big data for the enterprise. We'll address these and other questions with our guests today, Tom Roloff, who is the COO of EMC Consulting, and Matt Allen, who is a security practice lead at EMC. Gentlemen, welcome. 
Thank Good you. to see you, Dave. Tom, longtime Cube alum, welcome back. Nice to see you, Dave. Matt, Always fun to uh, meet you. Neophyte, uh, newbie, welcome. <laughs> Great to have you on here. Me, right? <laughs> uh, no, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but welcome anyway. So, uh, well, let's see. You guys have some some news. Why don't we start there, Matt? What are you guys announcing in this whole security and and, and trusted uh, uh, cloud virtualization privacy area? Sure, we're introducing um, several different offers that come as a portfolio of services provided by our security and risk management group. Um, within that offer set is really what I would call five primary services. Um, there's one overarching service that, that I would refer to as governance, risk, and compliance, or a series of governance, risk, and compliance oriented services. Underlying that are, among other things, the information governance services, um, mobile uh, device advisory services, fraud and identity management, and then uh, trusted cloud advisory um, from a you know a broader security and privacy perspective. So, so this is is new to the EMC consulting practice or an enhancement to that, Tom? Or? So, you know, I think EMC consulting has long been interested in cloud and big data and trust, frankly, and uh, we have had a number of I'd call them more point solutions in this space. But uh, but Matt has spent a lot of time um, both with his team and also with our RSA group to say, you know, there's some broader issues here that we need to be framing differently. So uh, by launching a set of services that are, I think, much more comprehensive, we may be able to bring uh, both an overarching perspective on governance, risk, and compliance in the cloud and in the age of big data, and also some more specific services around things like mobile or things like trusted cloud and some of the other things that Matt was referring to. So um, we've enhanced the services we have and, and really targeted them at um, both an overarching GRC conversation and then some of the things that we see going on in our clients' uh, IT organizations today around trusted cloud, mobile devices, information governance, and so on. So Tom, you're one of EMC's go-to guys when, when CIOs are involved. You talk to a lot of CIOs. What are they telling you about security these days? Yeah, so that's uh, behind some of these offerings, frankly, right? I think I think CIOs are saying a couple things to us. They're saying, hey, this, uh, this big data uh, age is really coming upon us, right? So uh, not only is information doubling about every 18 months, um, but the kinds of information that I'm having to manage is now very different. It's a uh, you know, highly unstructured set of information. It's not just the thing sitting in my relational databases anymore. Uh, it's the nature of that data is changing significantly. And so I've got to make sure I understand how to manage that differently. So that's one trend. Um, I think the second is uh, the regulatory scrutiny going on in IT right now is just huge. And so everything's got to be documented and everything's got to be retained for very long periods of time. So. Uh, making sure that you actually can prove to somebody that you're compliant with the regulations that you're under, if you're a bank or a, or a pharmaceutical company or a healthcare uh, business of some kind, is a mounting problem for them. And finally, I think we see the third part of this, which is the, the proliferation of access devices, right? It used to be that if we secure the perimeter of our data center, well, then we can have some peace in, uh, on, the on the belief that we've secured our information. But now we can access data in so many different ways from so many different places that securing the perimeter is, an, is a problem that, um, frankly, I think we've lost that battle and we have to think about different ways to secure information. So CAOs are asking us, uh, information's exploding, I got to make sure I'm compliant and, uh, and I'm trying to access it from all kinds of different places and can you, EMC Consulting, help? And, and this is partly a response to that. So I, I want to come back to what EMC Consulting can do to help, but before we do that, Matt, this is interesting what Tom's saying about securing the perimeter. Sure. I, I think of the, the castle and the moat and sure. sometimes the queen wants to leave her castle. Right. And so in this physical world, you've got, you know what port is connected to what drive is connected to what server, and it's all sort of known. In the virtual world, it's just one big massive stuff. So can you take certain aspects of traditional security in, in the physical world and apply them to virtual? Uh, if so, which ones, and, and what is different about cloud and virtualization? Sure, the answer is yes, you can, and, and, and I think you know Tom mentions a great point. The you know the just the massive explosion of data and, and the requirements that different organizations have as a, as a result of that explosion, the changing security requirements sort of drives that. So, what I would say is what we have found, and the backdrop to some of Tom's points is that most organizations or most of our our customers and clients in the broader marketplace are viewing the need to marry the broader risk framework or the control framework associated with security into more of a corporate view. So said in fairly tactical terms, security is now a, a risk in many different angles and many different parts that's much greater, much bigger in dollar terms and much more likely than I think anyone really understood until now. 
With that, we see a series of very significant risks to any organization and the need for a control framework to manage those risks or those very specific security items. So kind of to your, you know, your reference point, the queen leaving it certainly can leave with the right permission and the right framework and the right controls and guards and policies and procedures around her as long as it's done, done effectively. So, I mean, I'd just add on that, David, right? I think one of the things we used to say, you said, what's, what's the same and what's different? We used to think that if we built a big enough moat, we could sort of keep everything inside, right? Or we could at least make sure we know what's going across the drawbridge, right? Now I think we're starting to say, hey, man, things are going, there's too many broad drawbridges. There's too many ways in and out of the castle. And so we have to make sure that we understand the information itself and that we're securing and tagging and, and managing the information at its source. And, and you know, putting the, the, the metadata, putting the, uh, the, the policies and controls at the level of the information element rather than at the level of the drawbridge, right? And so I think, I think some of the things that we're talking about from a control framework perspective, those things apply from the physical world as well. But I think what's new is we got to not worry about the moat. We got to worry about the data itself and how to secure that. So our, our executives, let's break it down. Are our IT executives ready for this? And are the sort of C-suite executives ready for this? You know, Matt's got some interesting perspectives on this, but I, I will tell you that um, there are a number of people in the IT and the security organization to understand the problem. They are having to go uh, educate uh, the business executives and the C-suite executives around the risks that now exist. And frankly, that's a very complicated conversation, right? Because it is, uh, you know, Matt and I joke about this frequently, right? The, the time that, that the business side figures out that risk and security and trust is important is sort of after they've had the breach, right? That, that, that's when they realize that there is a vulnerability and a, and a risk to their information that they didn't think about before. Mm -hmm. Uh, it is partly our job, I think, and partly our mission to go keep people from having those breaches to begin with. Um, and some of what we in EMC Consulting are trying to do with Matt and his practice is to, to, to get people healthy and get people to be managing and aware of their risks before they become uh, the, the breaches that uh, you'll read around the newspaper. Uh, you've got some more perspectives on that, Matt. One of the things that I, I, I guess, um, you know, specifically um, answering par part of your question, um, the point, um, there is still a difference between the way um, I think parts of the organization communicate about the significance of the risks from a security perspective um, that leaves a lot of open questions for any organization. Said in really specific terms, what we find is the significance, the breadth and depth of the risks that any organization is exposed to from a security perspective, both logical or physical as, as, you know, as it relates to infrastructure, um, are now so acute and so large and frankly are the cover of the Wall Street Journal variety. They're not the type of risk um, that anyone would want to take lightly, but the ability to communicate about the nature of those risks, um, what they mean, how one manages them, what you do to proactively prevent them, um, the way that's communicated within senior leadership groups, I think still has a little bit to be desired. And I think it's frankly one of the places that we see um, ourselves being able to help our clients and customers in a pretty comprehensive way understand how to communicate those messages from a, a very tactical, technical, specific um, kind of topic matter to broader business terms that a chairman of the board or a board of directors and a senior leadership team would want to hear and at the same time understand what the exposure would mean to the organization and then how you deal with you know any number of other disclosure requirements as a result of understanding that information. So people in your world, um, the consultant world, let's say prior to the big cloud push, might have gone in and, and started with the baseline. Where are we at? Let's do an audit. Um, let's figure out the physical and the logical and let's break, let's do it by all the stovepipes that we have in our organization, the network, the storage, the servers, et cetera. Um, talk about and I know this is new, new services do, how do you expect that to change in terms of the services that you provide? This probably, obviously you got to do some baselining, where, where are we at, uh, but how much of what you're doing is sort of trying to balance the portfolio and coming up with strategies for security? For me, especially as it relates to the way we've talked about this, I think the big change over the course of the last few years anyway has been um, the idea that information and data has transitioned from some version of commodity to asset and depending on the organization, extremely valuable asset, um, one that needs to sort of be protected at, at all costs. All the risks have to be dealt with and managed in a proactive fashion. 
um, with you know broader you know control frameworks that are that are a part of any good security posture going forward. So that's sort of the the baseline. You've mm -hmm. got to think about that transition and what it means going forward. I think you could also make the case that um, as you roll that out, security as we know it now will continue to evolve into a formal function within every organization designed to protect that asset, just as you would protect any physical asset that we currently have. The problem is, heretofore, we've sort of thought about physical assets in physical asset terms. It's a piece of property, and we have security guards protecting it at a, at a physical level. In this instance, data is a little more temporal, information is a little more esoteric, and at some level, that asset needs to be sized and scoped, and the extent of the exposure associated with it becomes the basis for the security posture. This opens up a whole interesting discussion. Does data and asset are a liability? Yes. Um, <laughs> right, right. And, and you've got this yin and yang, you know, tugging at each other. You know, the, yeah. the more you treat it as a risk, the more you handcuff your yeah. business lines. Uh, is that a part of what you guys expect to be sorting out with, with CIS? You know, I, I think we, we definitely spend a lot of time helping clients think about what is the, what are the information assets they have, and frankly, where are they? And, uh, you know, you were bringing up before the physical world and, and the virtual world, right? Not only is the virtual world change things about where the information is when it's inside the four walls of the enterprise, but increasingly a lot of the information is actually beyond the four walls of the enterprise, right? I'm using salesforce.com for my, uh, you know, my sales pipeline. Well, now I've moved a lot of information that is specific to my company to a public cloud, to a software as a service provider, right? That's an additional set of assets that I now have to manage that are beyond the four walls of my enterprise. But by the way, I'm still a regulated company, and I'm still accountable for the the compliance of the information that is sitting in somebody else's uh, virtual cloud architecture and making sure that I'm managing that correctly, right? So I think we do spend a lot of time helping clients think about what is the information they have today? How does that tie to the policies by which they want to govern those assets? How does that uh, affect, how is that affected by the regulatory environment that that, in, in, that, that enterprise uh, is subjected to? And frankly, what decisions should they be making about how to govern those assets and how to at least understand and mitigate the risks that, uh, that might exist around those assets? So. This is complicated, right? Because um, you've now got the whole sourcing issue. And maybe before cloud you had yeah. EDI and, yeah. and okay, yeah. fine. Yeah. But now I've got, let's say I got Salesforce and maybe I got Amazon, I may have a, an enterprise cloud service provider. Yeah. They might have all different policies. I mean, where does you know compliance fit in and how does that relate to the organizational challenges that you, you see? It's a huge issue, right? I think, I think uh, it's one of those C-suite issues, right? And, and unfortunately, um, you know, it's one of those sweet C-suite issues that is there, but but I think senior executives are hoping somebody has it covered, only to find when a breach happens that that it isn't covered, right? And so I think one of the things that that all the press about this is actually making people realize is they they got to get much more proactive about about governance, risk, and compliance of information assets. They have to get much more of an understanding about. What are their information assets today? Where are they? How are they securing them? And what vulnerabilities exist? And how would they mitigate those? Uh, and I think that's, you know, I think the the whole compliance and regulatory world is a is is, is very much making people uneasy um, about about what they know about their information today. I don't know, Matt, what you want to add to that. This is, I think, it's a sort of an important note as it relates to the way we've set the practices, the, pra the services up um, under the broader banner of GRC or governance, risk, and compliance. Um, this is something that from my perspective, almost everybody in the marketplace is struggling with. How do we marry some fairly disparate concepts under the guise of risk, um, compliance, and ongoing, uh, what I would call ongoing systemic alignment with controls in a way that we, to this point, haven't or haven't had to? And that's sort of an important note. Um, if we've gotten nothing out of sort of the, the economic meltdown over the course of the last few years and all of the, the, the kind of the um, rockiness of the market is, a very clear difference um, in the demands of the broader marketplace in understanding the extent of the risks and or compliance requirements of the companies that they're either investing in or are somehow a stakeholder in. Said in really practical terms, I think we're all asking a lot of very different questions now about the companies that we have a vested interest in than we ever did before. 
under this comes the kind of the broader banner of GRC or governance, risk, and compliance, and providing every organization with an ability to answer those questions from a single platform that, as I said in the beginning, have heretofore been sort of disparately aligned in different functions or buried in different parts of the organization. The backbone of all of that is literally data and information without you know beating that to death. The idea that um, that asset drives that GRC platform is no mistake. It's clear and that's the big change for everybody. It gets you away from this tactical response to security questions and into a broader systemic management of risk. How do you deal with the, or how do you f see companies dealing with this sort of lowest common denominator problem? In other words, you do the gap analysis before and you know you do the risk and reward and you say, okay, we can, we can live with that. But now you've got all these external suppliers. Um, they might define breaches differently. They might have different policies. And they might not let you come in and audit them. So do you, do you revert to like a caravan to the slowest truck in the <laughs> caravan? Or, you know, or, or can you, do you see clients actually being able to affect the policies of service providers? How is that whole thing shaking out? So, I mean, I think it's a very interesting question you're asking, right? So, w what we do when we advise clients, we spend a lot of time, as you and I have talked about before, about you know public clouds and private clouds and hybrid clouds, right? How do you decide what workloads belong in the private cloud? What what you, should you move to the public cloud? How do you interconnect those things? One of the things we we spend a lot of time with clients on is saying, hey, the things you move to that public cloud environment you need to know a lot more about the public cloud than just the functionality of the service you're going to get, just the economics of what you're looking at. You actually need to understand the service level and the risk profile that you're comfortable with in that service provider. And so, you know, asking for service level agreements around, you know, availability and uptime and so on is one part of it, but asking for service level agreements around the security side of the equation an increasingly important part, in my opinion, of clients making decisions to move things to public clouds. Now, f frankly, Dave, I think there's a lot of fear, uncertainty, and doubt about how secure the public cloud is. I think it can be very secure, um, but I think it's up to clients to start demanding that public cloud providers demonstrate and prove how secure they are. And, uh, and I think that's one thing that we're certainly uh, encouraging our clients who are thinking about the, the public cloud um, to, to ask themselves, wh what has to be true of that public cloud environment before you should entrust it with data that, frankly, you have policies and regulations um, and, and obligations to manage in a certain way. Do you think that the security can be a differentiator for a public cloud? And it's sort of an obvious question, but is it becoming a differentiator for public cloud environments? Do you have enough data and knowledge to discern? I mean, you know, Amazon versus maybe, uh, you know, let's say an enterprise class, yeah, sure, but is it is it more nuanced than that? You know, I think larger enterprises are more willing to go put a price tag on that, frankly, right? So will you pay me X for my public cloud service and X plus something for my secure public cloud service? Value-based security right, pricing. Right? I think, I think uh, f frankly, we need to do, as an industry, a better job of educating people about the value of the additional security. Now, you know, clients will see the downside of it when they have a breach. And at that point, they're like, man, I should have paid that X plus something price, right? right? But then it's too late. And so I think one of the things that we're, we're constantly talking to clients about is, you know, don't have the heart attack before you realize you got to get on, uh, you know, on a training regimen yeah. here, basically, right? Do you feel like uh, in this world of virtualization and cloud and hybrid cloud and public cloud and private cloud that security is in a large part a do-over? <laughs> Um, I, I sort of, uh, <laughs> I, I, I guess the way I would say it is for me, um, having been within the, you know, the industry for maybe too long now, I feel like there's a little bit of a refresh every five years, um, with almost without fail. And it's the nature of the changes in, in the broader m marketplace for, um, enabling technologies. Um, with those changes comes changes in the requirements associated with security and the standards that are applied for any organization. So um, the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, it really is a function, though, of I think the, the breakneck pace of change that we all undergo when you start talking about um, infrastructure components and requirements and the way the technology changes, how or rather um, the implications to a security posture that those changes impose. Um, it's important that everybody's ahead of that curve, and it's in every five-year cycle easily. I, you know, I would add maybe that we've treated security as something that we set up a security operation, and we hired a chief security officer, and check we've got that managed, right? But I don't think that, that information risk is like that anymore. 
Uh, I think that information is becoming, A, much more important, uh, much more both an asset and a liability, and we need to more systemically embed security into the way we do things in IT and in the business. And in that sense, it is a do-over, right? In that sense, it is not something that an outside group can just go manage and make sure you've got covered. It is something that your entire IT organization, and frankly, the business side of the house, has to understand much more deeply. And um, that's not the mentality that exists yet around um, around information risk management. So it's a mindset do-over, yeah. at least. Yeah, sure. Do you think that, um, so everybody talks about cloud security and how risky it is, but I happen to be of the opinion, especially as a small business person, that the public cloud security for certain public cloud providers is way better than I could provide myself, and that's probably true for the vast majority of enterprises. You know, maybe not for B of A, right. you know, but for a lot of small, mid-sized businesses. Um, my question is, generally, can cloud security be better, and what are the attributes that could make it better? I, I think the, the the short answer is yes, it can be better. I think um, the the way you want to think about you know you know what is it that makes it better is clearly defined attributes associated with security. What are the, the fundamental components of having a secure environment? What does that mean? And that's unfortunately a combination of both best practices, so different ISO standards and or you know, you know, broader industry marketplace um, best practices that will find themselves you know, you know, sort of in the de facto best practices framework that everybody adheres to at one level or another. But I think the thing that's missed almost every time in that conversation is the need to have a security posture and set of requirements, um, no matter what your environment, that are unique to your organization and conform to your needs from the way you use data and or transport your asset, where you house it, where you manage it. All of your unique business requirements are incorporated in that set of best practices and the requirements that you have from a security posture going forward. So let's talk a little bit about EMC. Why EMC Consulting? Um, I mean, it's a relatively new entity. I mean. You know, a lot of lot of internal stuff and some acquisitions. Why EMC? Well, you know, I think uh, I think some of what's driving the need for another look at security is some of the disruptions that that EMC and frankly EMC Consulting is very concerned about. Right, one of them is uh, the the change to cloud computing, and uh, and with it the the mindset shift and the the relook at how we're securing information, not just within our own enterprise, right, which is now becoming uh, highly uh, disaggregated, but also across our existing enterprise and um, and the public cloud providers or the partners that we're looking at, right. So, because EMC Consulting is very much central to helping clients um, understand how to leverage the cloud in the right way, I think we we owe it to our clients to give them a sense for how does security in that environment uh, become an increasingly important thing for them to think about. So. One is the disruption from the cloud side of the equation. Another, in my opinion, is that, you know, EMC talks frequently about the big data story and about the fact that not only is information exploding, but the kinds of information that we're being asked to manage, the, the unstructured, you know, big data nature of information that we're now having to manage. That's another trend that EMC is very focused on, and frankly, that EMC Consulting is very focused on helping clients understand. So um, the, the convergence of a cloud architecture change, a rapid acceleration of, of data uh, and the big data world, means that security becomes a central component to both of those changes. And uh, frankly, we have believed very strongly that we can't answer the question around cloud adequately without having a strong opinion about security. We can't answer the question about big data and the explosion of information without coming up with a better answer for how that security and risk management of that data asset needs to be managed. So it's a central part of what we as a company at EMC do and, and frankly what we at EMC Consulting so do. You see it as a compulsory capability to enable growth. Very and, much so. And adoption. Very much so. Sure. You know, and I'll add, I mean, you know, the RSA division of EMC yeah. is I think a world-class organization when it comes to securing information, right? So we're, we're very uh, keenly aware of the leading edge technologies that are being developed right now. They're being developed by the EMC and the RSA division of EMC. And so uh, having that tight connection to the RSA side of the house, I think, um, gives us some insights into what is technologically feasible. And VMware, I mean, you're at the heart of it. You bet. Virtualization, um, obviously cloud, big data, data-centric, RSA. I mean, so sort of why wouldn't you be in the middle of the storm? Take it if we agree. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. Um, you know, it might be useful, uh, Matt, maybe this is a question for you. Can you go through a, an example, uh, either, you know, a real one or a hypothetical one, you know, scrub the names of, yeah, sure. of how you guys would actually 
deploy and what problems you'd solve? Sure. Um, I, I think with increasing frequency, what we're seeing um, from certainly a segment of the marketplace is a, uh, an acute interest in understanding how to systemically approach um, security from a broader strategy perspective. Very specifically, how do we set up uh, an environment that gives us the ability to frame up security engineering requirements, security architecture, internal audit requirements, external audit requirements, and do this in a way that maps to our business processes, one, and to our control framework in a way that gives us the ability to manage the security posture um, in a way that's consistent with business requirements. So there's a there's a sort of a lot of technical ins and outs associated with that, but in practical terms, we're on a pretty regular basis now getting calls sort of after the fact that Tom talked about a little bit. And what we're seeing is, as I kind of referenced earlier, a kind of a, a, a big gap between the technical infrastructure group at one level or another charged with dealing with security um, matters or measures at one level or another, and the business leaders and the, the, their ability to communicate and understand how to prioritize all the risks associated with security, what's required from a broader infrastructure perspective um, in base security terms, and what the costs and benefits are of that going forward. So sort of in really practical terms, very common to get calls from customers or clients who've experienced a significant breach at one level or another, or some fall down in security, security requirements or uh, security perimeters and not understand what to do to react or how to react and what the, the next very specific tactical steps are. This is a part that I think is missed. The importance of this is missed by sort of the broader marketplace until you're in the throes of that problem. Very specifically, there's a lot of legal requirements, disclosure requirements, compliance requirements associated with what one does once an event has happened and us helping, or what we typically do, is help our clients understand what that broader framework is, escalation policies and procedures, um, literally the processes and tasks and activities that one engages in to manage the security environment. I, I, and there's even a, a, there's a, there's another complexity that I just want to put out there and, and get your, your feedback on is, you talk about business processes, Tom, we've talked about the application portfolio before. So you've got the applications supporting the business processes, and that's sort of the link to the IT infrastructure. A lot of times application portfolios are not well documented, or they're just this uh, you know, boil the ocean spreadsheet. Uh, business processes often aren't well documented. Right. People don't understand the dependencies, and they don't understand the data flows. Um, can you help? Um, sure. and, and number one, and number two is can you eventually teach me how to fish so I don't have to call back every time? <laughs> <laughs> sure, and, and the short answer is that's uh, one of the objectives behind our, our engagements, typically, is helping our clients understand or our customers understand um, what's required of them going forward, how to literally put the, implement the framework and then manage it going forward, mm -hmm. where we typically, from a kind of a broader engagement lifecycle perspective, um, find ourselves acting as subject matter expert, experts as time goes on after we've gone in and implemented that security posture and ongoing framework management. Yeah, I mean, you know, just uh, if you look at the five services we, we announced, right, so one of them is around um, fraud detection, right? So often in the web, in the online world, right, somebody has some kind of an online breach uh, coming in, and, and uh, unfortunately we get the call after they've noticed that there's been an online breach of some kind, right? So the the fraud detection has already happened. Now we got to get to the point where we can help you prevent that going forward, right? So so our 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 approach there might be to say, here's maybe what happened, here are the are the architectural things you could do to prevent that in the future, and by the way, here are the kinds of things you need to start monitoring on a regular basis, because the threats are evolving, and, and you need to be looking out for much more than you're looking out for today. So we seek to try to uh, educate you, n not about, you know, here's the latest worm that's been released, and that, you know, you got to look out for this signature, but rather, here are the kinds of policies and the kind of procedures and the kinds of uh, uh, gaps that you have that you need to go address more proactively. And, and we hope that when we have helped you to understand how to do that once, that you're building the muscle to kind of continue to do that going forward. We may leave some technologies behind and some tools behind that let you do that, but, but our hope is there that, um, that that's not an event, um, that, that that becomes a muscle that you're building in this regard. So my last question, you guys are big on journeys, right? So this is sort of the beginning of a new new journey. Where do you see this going in the next you know, several years? What's this whole business going to look like? 
you know, I think um, if if we are successful, this becomes a pervasive part about how you think about information, right? So just as the cloud is a way to architect your information infrastructure and application portfolio differently, uh, to us, security and risk management is a way to think about the asset and liability side of information differently. Um, it's it's the kind of thing that cannot be ignored as you as information starts to leave the physical confines of a data center, um, as you start leveraging public, private, and hybrid clouds, as you start virtualizing in the world of big data, right? It has to be an integral part of the way you think about information. So if we're successful, we'll help clients think about um, their data and their information with a lens to security, with a lens to how to secure that information in the right way. And uh, and that won't be um, you know a firewall and an intrusion detection strategy That'll be uh, an information management strategy that includes the governance, risk, and compliance of information. So we're here at Wikibon headquarters. Uh, this is Dave Vellante. I'm with Tom Roloff and Matt yeah. Allen. We're talking about security, EMC, identifying what I've always said is a major barrier to adoption. It's the tip of the spear, EMC consulting coming in and, and actually facilitating new services that will assist with cloud security and virtualization security, and uh, it's something that I think that you guys have to step up to. You're well aware, uh, you talk to clients every day, and they're, I'm sure, pounding on you to help solve this problem. So congratulations on uh, taking it head on, and uh, good luck with the services. Thank thanks, you. Dave, thanks, thanks for coming into theCUBE. All right, everybody, thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.